My hobbies is microwave, amateur radio microwave, and uh, the other hobby, the longer one is model airplanes, radio control, and I thought I would combine the two by sending down information and learning about 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi, 2.4 gigahertz is in the microwave region, and so I can give talks like this to my microwave pals and it's appropriate. Uh, the XB is so popular with the microcontroller types that they even have our Arduino mo modules with the socket already available for uh, XB, and they have underneath it the appropriate translation. Here is a, a sensor that you can buy from uh, SmartFun, where you can put the uh, between the battery and the uh, controller for the motor of your model airplane or anything, you, they, they sell you just this part, and then you solder on a connector on each end. In this case, I've adopted the servo wire that you, that's associated with model airplanes, and you'll notice that all I had to do was rearrange one wire, uh, the, and it plugs into the the ascending unit, the XB that's, that's, is in here, is powered by a model airplane battery, and I'm going through model airplane, not through, but in parallel with the, the receiver. I'm using the receiver here as only a way of making two female connectors come together. But this unit would, would be in, uh, would be inside this airplane, this, this you strap it underneath the vans all the way on, for example. Uh, another application of XB that I've used is um, uh, this is a field strength meter for the microwave region, and I have an output here that can go to the XB, and you put this some distance away, and then the receiver is where your transmitter is, and, and you can see what this signal strength is as you move the antenna about. This is the same thing, a field strength meter for 72 megahertz. This is a um, uh, pitot tube. Maybe some of you are into real airplanes, recognize the configuration there. Two ports, one on the side of the tube, one on the end, and it goes to a pressure differential measuring device. And I have two wires here because I needed to get the 4.8 volts from the model airplane, and then this connector goes to the to the sending unit that's XB. I thought I'd take a second here to show you a little bit about um, prototyping because it's so spark fun like. Uh, this this these mod these solderless matrix I think they call them are for inserting parts and bringing them together with jumpers that look like, like this. And there's ribbon connectors that look like this and female ribbon connectors, which you can turn into a male with, with things like this. All is available at SparkFun. Then after you've uh, uh, got your circuit to work, you transfer it to the solder version that's the same exact pattern as the solderless version. And it's very important that when you use uh, these prototyping tools that you have enough parts to copy from the working prototype to the solder version. Never move because when you move, you lose track of the, the perspective of where the part came from. You have the additional advantage that when you have two, when you have one working unit, and the solder one doesn't work, you can go back and forth to see where you made a mistake. Here's a trick that's unique to me. This is how I put together electrical projects because the cabinet can easily cost more than all the other parts put together. I buy this. It's called flashing. It's normally just 90 degrees, and I've got a little further after poking the holes in it. It's so cheap, it's less than a dollar, that you can make a, a trial run 
just put the holes anywhere and then you see, oh yeah, this hole needs to be over this way. And very, very handy trick to use. I call it Pioneer Town because when you go to a, an old western make-believe place, you see the buildings with the fake front. Well, that's what I got. Uh, this is uh, 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 one of the easier uh, sensors that you can buy, also through SparkFun. It's an ultraviolet detector with an amplifier underneath it, a single chip, less than 10 bucks. And the, it says uh, out, ground, and 3.3. Well, clearly, you get the 3.3 wire or a jumper, and, and, and then let's see, you just rearrange whatever pattern you have coming out of here. And I've got it hooked up to channel two. Channel one that you see here is is hooked or is listening to this sensor simulator which I've got in random DC mode. It's a extremely low pass filter on a source of noise. It's an amplified noise of current going through a zener in case any of you are interested in noise. Um, and but the other channel is is this prototype of the UV detector. And UV is in abundance in this uh, pointer. You probably noticed these ultraviolet pointers. They're not very bright until you hit it on a piece of paper. And that's because paper has an ultraviolet to visible phosphor in it. A lot of people don't know that. It's a fairly cheap dye and it's very easily diluted. See, now that white there's got plenty of that UV. And uh, if you put it on a phosphor, you see it turns green demonstrating that this is pretty far away from the visible. You still see it because it's bright enough, five milliwatts. Now I'm gonna hit it on the, the detector and the, the voltage is not being displayed here on this, this, on this channel. The channel one is what's going to this audio voltmeter. This is changes, it ch this displays a change in voltage as a change in frequency. And you can see one application is you could have have a shooting gallery where where the target is far away and the sound or the display is close to you and there's no wires in between. That's a simple sensor. More sophisticated sensors so they're becoming more popular. They have letters like um, SCL, SCA, those are digital outputs. And there are three lead devices, like a, a thermometer. It looks just like a 292 transistor. V, uh, volt VCC, that's the three volts that runs it. Ground, and the middle wire is digital out. And that's where the Arduino people, and I confess that I am not an expert on Arduino, but that's where interfacing with the Arduino makes sense. But what I'm going to show you today is just is connecting is what you've demonstrated, what you've seen here is where I'm not using any computers, just going from XB to XB and and uh, and uh, this this slideshow is actually 200 slides long and I'm going to make it available on the website uh, for 23B but I'm only going to show you the first 49 slides, and I'm going to speed through the rest so you can see what's what's in it. Okay, uh, four $40 modules used in pairs to connect two Arduinos with Wi-Fi up to a mile. That's the most common use. They can also send analog and digital data to each other without a computer of any kind. Sensors or switch positions on the remote XB, voltmeter or LEDs on the nearby XB. That's the focus of this presentation. I think you need to move your laptop back. Yeah, just slide, a slide the laptop a little bit. It's impinging what, the, Like uh, this? Forward, towards you. Towards you. I can't. The keep screen going, is keep going to screen. Screen. I can't. Yeah, I'm just like this. Oh. Yeah, it's just clipping the edges of the Great, display. thank you. Um, 
How XBs differ from ham radio? Would, uh, uh, data transfer involves confirmation. So even though the information goes only one way from here to here, both units both have to be able to transmit and receive with equal agility. Uh, data is sent in bursts. The carrier is off most of the time. Data is not audio. The analog channel can only send changes no faster than 50 samples per second. There are other modules, much cheaper ones, that also use Wi-Fi, but XB has very long ranges of up to a mile. XB can be part of a network, yet you can address a particular XB, for example, uh, and on the fly, too. You receive some information where you need data from a sensor that's on another XB, you would just address that. You'd say, send me the data. Way over my head at this point. XB can send data to the internet by way of smartphone hotspots. There are websites where you're flying along in your helicopter, you receive some data, you send it to this website, and then anybody in the world can access that data. XB has the ability to send and receive data without a computer. 11 buffered digital inputs, 10 digital outputs, and seven analog inputs in addition to the digital inputs, and even two analog outputs. Now those, in some combination, can occur at the same time. This, uh, this particular this sending XB, I put in a switch, and you can see the green light lights up. That tells me that I've got a good connection, but normally I'm just using the analog uh, inputs. Uh, the XB module has a non-standard pin spacing 2 millimeters. That's non-standard for us, the amateur uh, electronic type. It's not uh, a non-standard for the more professional users. The input-output digital logic and the power is 3.3. This is also not a standard for micro controllers or the USB. An adapter is needed for most applications. The adapter is needed to change the pin spacing to tenth of an inch, which is what these are, and, and the power and the stream of data, which I'm talking about, another pin, has to be changed to from three to five. Many microcontroller boards have that adapter built in. They're, the uh, circuitry for the adapter is underneath the mezzanine that the XB is on. Most most common use of XB is, as you see here in this, with this picture, with microcontroller at each end, and often uh, with a computer at one end. Here's an interface board with a USB that goes to a laptop or a desktop computer, and there's no wires, and, and often that's all you'll see. The, the, you just need a software um, knowledge to make this work. Um, the interface board is not needed if XB is used without a microcontroller, and you provide the three bolts. Here's an example of a board that, um, that, that you see the red thing underneath the blue? That's the interface board, but in this case, it's only to interface the pin spacing. The, the power is provided by the three volts. Okay. When not used with microcontroller, the phrase that, that XP manuals and people use is line passing mode. It's, uh, you might think of it as parallel processing, but it's really it's a serial processing where they take apart the, the signals and provide you with the seven different outputs. Uh, here uh, you can see that uh, uh, this is the, the receiving unit because it's got LEDs. And in this particular example, there's an external antenna, which I didn't bring, and a connector that goes to the XB. Most XB applications have an internal antenna. Transmit circuit, you can tell, because it has the, the switches, and there's a loose wire there, which uh, is for some analog input. In this case, it has an internal antenna. See that, that cut, the, the, the 45 degree and then the flat top, the antenna goes up one side over and then down and that's the 90 degrees that you need for uh, 
the antenna to work in. Okay, here's both of them side by side. The power for both is, in this case, in this example, comes from the USB that's plugged into them. In operation, it will be powered by a battery, of course, but you can also do the wiring with, with, uh, with the battery. Note the interface board. This is the line passing mode. There are a variety of interface boards. On the left is one made by Parallax. They have about uh, uh, three or four. And Smart Fun, they like to make theirs red. They have even more. Different combinations of USB connector and uh, uh, <coughs> what the, the standard for robotics digital communication is it NTXC. I forget those letters. You'll, I'll come up with them here. There's a blank Explorer board. You can have headers um, socket soldered to it and it will allow the XB to be removable. And then that's a good idea because these units, uh, the ones I have here are for one mile. And they're 60 milliwatts. That's a pretty good drain on the battery, by the way. And and they're 40 bucks. The, the uh, one milliwatt uh, type is closer to 20 bucks. Okay, uh, you can also uh, put the connector underneath the assembly so that the whole assembly is removed. There's all kinds of modular ways to use it. The Explorer board here with pins underneath it is uh, for use in proto boards, and obviously it's got a USB connector too. The, the other one has got a lower header, could be for a base station. It doesn't have, excuse me, it doesn't have the header on the bottom. It's not soldered in. It's the same exact header, but it's not, the header's not soldered in. And, and that would be for saving a little bit of room. And also a little bit of time, you know, to solder it. There's also a difference here with these two in, 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 in appearance, and that's because of the antenna type. The light blue patch, that's what this one is, is, is a, a dielectric antenna, and it has the feature of being fairly equally sensitive in all directions. Uh, but it doesn't have quite as much gain as the other one, the more conventional uh, antenna. Uh, but that one you have to kind of aim a little bit to get the full range. Of course, uh, for modest ranges, uh, anything will work. The, the, uh, the, there are two other uh, type of XBs which have sockets on them that you can use to put your own antenna, including any Wi-Fi you probably, yeah. You, if you've seen Wi-Fi antennas that are about this long, I forgot to bring mine, and you pick up 16 dB of gain, which is like a factor of six in range, but then you have to point it at where you think your airplane is. Okay, now begins the tutorial. Uh, that teaches XB wiring and configuration. This part I'm going to go through really fast. Just to show you what's involved. The, uh, one of the confusing things about XB is, or the most confusing things, is, is uh, understanding where these pins are and what they do. What I've done in this set of slides is presented, uh, uh, gone step by step show how uh, these pins are used and where they are. Uh, this slide, you can't see the background, uh, is, is for use between Arduinos. This is the most common use, and you notice how few wires, just four. Ground, D out, and D in. That's a stream of digital data that, that pin three and four is here, as opposed to separate wires that would engage an LED or sense a switch position. And uh, what's the baud rate on that stream? Uh, the uh, the baud rate is 9600 to be safe, and it has one step above that. I don't know what the standard is, 112 or something. And people complain that it can't keep up. But that now that's the baud rate between computer and the XP. The oh, the the, the, the pacing item is actually the RF connection between the two. This is the default mode for configuring the XBs. You buy the XB, you plug it on, on an Arduino, and then just assume that there's three wires going to another Ar Arduino, except that it's up to a mile separation. The configuring is, is rather hard to do, and it's why this slideshow is so darn long. 
but I wanted to give you an idea. Oh, that's what's involved when you do without the computer. Okay. Um, this gives you an idea how much is involved in understanding why you need this slideshow. Okay. It's going to come to a stopping point here in a second. All right. The the XCTU is the PC software that's used to configure the XB, and that's do done through the Explorer, that's this, this red module, the interface, through their USB connection. And uh, again, I'm just spitting through here so you can see, this is some details, if you download this uh, PowerPoint show, you can follow each step here and have it working. I thought I would uh, stop here a minute and uh, d demonstrate in real life the output. And uh, what we have here is a sensor simulation of a low noise, of a, of a low frequency noise source. Here's half a hertz, that's an oscillator in there, half a hertz. And I'm going to connect it instead to a oscillator that I can vary somewhat. So the oscilloscope on the right is only connected via your radio. There, are, there isn't any other wire. That's right. right, thanks. That was an analyst. All right, now I've got a, a one, about one cycle per second now, and I'm going to make it go a little faster. And you can see that it's starting to reveal the, the, the limitation of the pulse rate that's going through the air. Um, let me see. Like that. I've got spot for the camera. Yeah. Oh. Huh. the steps, individual steps, the, that's about 20 milliseconds or 50 cycles, and that's the, the frame rate that is is sent by the XB. Is that an analog output? Th that clearly that's an analog output, but each step is a jump, you might right. say, and, and it corresponds to a uh, uh, I, th this picture and the slides here make it clearer. I'm speeding up the the um, uh, the, the sweep rate on the scope, 20 milliseconds, 5 milliseconds, and I've changed the source frequency. And here at 7 hertz, you can see the steps are beginning to be about the same as the the um, the frequency of the sending source. And if I go on to the next one here. Uh, it, uh, uh, oh, on the top is the RF output. Uh, my oscilloscope isn't behaving well today. It didn't like move. But uh, the top is the pulses. This is there's the detector, uh, microwave detector, and I put it next to the sending XB, and this is what the pulses look like. There's four and then two, four and two, four and two. And here's a little faster, and this is one step taking the whole screen up. And you can see two and four, and they don't seem to line up at all. That's because the data is buffered and then sent uh, independent of the... So is, is, the, is this kind of fluctuation mostly because of limitations of transferring the data through the Zigbee, or, or is it for the XB? It's, it's uh, the reason there are pulses instead of continuous, maybe, is because I don't know, and I have asked in uh, XB group email places, and nobody seems to know. And the reason I believe is because to the communications world, the RF part is a dot, and even on block diagrams, it's just a square they go to. They, they don't really understand or want to know because there's so much complexity in the digital world, just pages and pages. And, gobs of it. Um, but uh, 
but since that is my hobby of the RF part of it, I I did explore a little bit and in depth, and that is the fact that somewhere in those pulses is in the information. It can't be the separation because no matter what you do in the way of input, the pulse widths stay the same, the separation, the height, everything's the same. It has to be, and it's by the way, there's a header that's huge, it's like 64 bytes of header, and and then there's this the uh, sum, what's it called, the correct sum that goes back the other way. Checksum. Checksum, thank you. And so the information is buried somewhere in those pulses. And you hear I stretched uh, one of the pulses out so it's halfway. You can't see anything. It's just white noise. And the white noise is very appropriate because it's being sent by spread spectrum technology. And I'm going to explain spectrum spread spectrum by using a historical example. Mortimer Rokoff, that's the name of it there. And uh, during the war, by the way, he's famous for other reasons. He is um, a naval engineer who loves the sea and uh, has got some awards and recognition for charting. His daughter is even more famous, or she's a philanthropist giving away zillions of dollars. Her family is uh, the Carlisle Group, who owns a lot of aerospace companies. Anyway, during the war, Mortimer Rogoff invented a way to mask the information going between transmitter and receiver in, in the following fascinating way. He took a wheel, about this big, and, and he divided into four times 360, 1,400 spaces, every quarter of a degree was an opening and he had a graphic artist make because different amounts of light going through each one in shades of gray that are about a hundred hundred different shades of gray you can't achieve that with grayscale using film but what he did is he used graphic arts with and the kind of photography that's extremely high resolution but no grayscale here what it's called anyway so that he could get different size stripes inside that little space. So he was able to have 1,400 different brightnesses, and he had a photocell and a, and a light source, and he spun this incredibly fast, as fast as the detector could detect. I'm talking megahertz now. This is in the 40s. Now, he modulated an RF carrier with this megahertz of noise. Oh, by the way, the value is kind of interesting. The value for each one is the, the middle two digits of 1,400 phone book phone numbers in the area that he lived in. And uh, now he had two of these disks, one of them on the receiver and one of them on the transmitter. Now, as some of you know, if you spin something that fast and it's varying, you got megahertz of what appears to be noise when you send that to mo the modulator section of an RF, you widen the the bandwidth of the signal. So the CW, you know, da, 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 that goes a long way because it's extremely narrow in bandwidth. The wider the bandwidth, the more power you need. So he, on purpose, made the bandwidth of the modulated signal so wide that it filled the band, megahertz of not just audio, but megahertz of bandwidth. That brought the power per frequency down to practically nothing. If you had a detector, a radio, that was sensitive to one particular frequency, you're only getting a tiny portion of all the information that he is sending. And even if you could mod detect the modulation, it would appear as what? Noise. Absolutely white noise. Now, on top of this signal on the sending end, he modulates it with a voice or some source of information but at a rate that's much, much lower than the wheel is spinning. Now when you look at it, you see an overwhelmingly bright noise signature and signal that is so far into the noise you can't possibly detect it. But when this receiver synchronized the exact same position as the transmitter of the wheel, you undo that noise so all you hear is the signal. Now what he didn't appreciate when he invented this is that not only are you resisting interference, but you're making it so that you have gain, it's called, um, 
bandwidth gain uh, that, that you're actually saving, you're economizing on your, your power so that you can get more information with less power with this method. And it's invulnerable to somebody who's trying to interfere with you if you send noise or we have another one of these signals on top of it, it's just noise on top of noise. This uh, model airplane receiver and the one in that airplane uses Wi-Fi and, and the pulse, again, pulsing. And in that pulse is the, is the spread spectrum technology. And uh, if you are an old timer in model airplanes, you may remember that you need to get a flag because there's only like 26 different frequencies. Well, with Wi-Fi and sped spectrum, you can have 62,000 airplanes flying at the same time. So there's no need to organize a club that makes sure that you're flying with a single frequency. So that's my Mortimer Rogoff story. Often if you hear people talk about um, uh, spread spectrum, you'll hear a Hedy Lamarr story mm -hmm. uh, and how she had the coding change frequencies. Well, it's kind of naive and it wasn't even classified. They kind of gave her the patent because she did this. Um, all her did was change frequencies from time to time. The key thing is that you have to change frequencies far faster than the modulated signal is changing. And uh, that, she didn't think of her boyfriend's All right, so that, uh, here's more on XCT. I'm going to run to the very end of this slideshow. There's a lot of work, and I have to show it off. Good job. Again, this, this tutorial is available online. And the uh, purchase recommendations. They're 40 bucks for that. There's an antenna that, <coughs> that you may want if you want some really long range stuff. Uh, there's uh, uh, suggestions on the interface boards and wires and prototyping equipment and uh, the two sources that I recommend. All right, that's it. Any questions? <coughs> Where do we get the, this uh, PowerPoint? So this PowerPoint presentation will be available on 23B uh, website. Okay. Yeah. I have a question about XCT or any of the other software. How much of that is free software and how much is proprietary? What was the, the X? Right, right, so the, the X, XCTU is the, was oh, the yeah, software yeah, was, or, or whatever the, other software is involved. Is, is it free software, proprietary? Yes, the, the software is available on the uh, XB website. They didn't write it, by the way. Uh, another stream, something wrote it, but they, they provided it. Uh, there's also, if any of you are real experts on modems, you'd have to be old to be an expert with modems, the, uh, the language Oh, excuse me, the protocol is AT, AT commands, and they, they use that traditionally, and so this XCTU software that resides on the computer is something rather new, and it allows it a little easier to, to uh, program these instead of knowing all the commands. Yeah. Um, have you heard of anybody using software to find radios to interact with XB hardware modules? No, but gosh, it sounds like a wonderful idea. Are you interested in that? Uh, Yes. Okay. Well, let's talk about it afterwards. afterwards. Is it? Yeah. Uh, if you wanted to run an XB transmitter for a few lines of analog or digital data, how many, or I guess how much juice, maybe in terms of uh, AA batteries or whatnot, would you need for a 24 hour period? So at, at maximum power, it's 6 million. Okay. And the, 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 the most of that power is in the RF, the transmitter, the pulse. And it's smart enough, just like your cell phone that if it's close, it knows not to use the full power. And there's also sleep modes. There's two kinds of sleep modes. And the, the sleep mode is where you are completely off, and then there's some CMOS clock in there that runs on micro watt, uh, yeah, micro watts, that, that wakes it up and looks around every 20 minutes or so and s sees if anybody's calling it. Uh, there's another mode that's a little less, uh, it's a little more current train than that, yeah. Well, that actually, that said, does it, if there's a packet that's supposed to go to one of these radios that's in sleep mode, do you know if it buffers that until it, until that wakes up, or how does that work at all? Well, it's, I don't know, that might, that's over my head. It, all I know is that 
it will wake it up. Oh, well, don't forget, the communication is always two ways. If, if, if the receiving XB can't confirm that it got something, the, the sending one won't send uh, the information that it needs. Um, so um, you referred to this as Wi-Fi. Is this the, the, uh, the same 802.11 protocols that, uh, that laptops use? It's, well, as you may know, there's lots of 802, uh, what is it, IEEE uh, standards. This this one is 802.15.4, okay. and the class is low cost, low data rate. So it had in mind this application. As you may know, the way standards are created is people who make things like this, they dream up a new uh, way of doing things, they get their competitors to consider it, and then they have conferences, and before you know it, after a few years, IEEE gets to make a standard out of it, but there's usually one dominant company, and Digi International is, uh, is uh, number one in the uh, uh, Zigbee, I think that's the standard, uh, 802.15.11.4, Others. Yeah, the analog channels. So you've got, I can't remember, six or seven. Yet. Two, that's the inputs, right? Or okay, let me talk about analog. I just, there's a digital, digital, DIO, DAIO, digital and analog channels. There's seven of them, and they could be uh, input or output. What's it? The, the, uh, there's more analog inputs than there are analog outputs. There's only, actually, there's only one analog channel, but they timeshare. But as far as we're concerned, there's two analogs. I've got, I labeled zero and one, and there's two uh, uh, BNC connectors there are, are the analog outputs. But now, there's more analog inputs than outputs. They go to that serial stream that the, the one that is the only one of interest to the, to the um, microcontrollers, and in that uh, they can simultaneously put them in line and then they go as a stream. I forget the standard that they use, but it's the same one that Arduino uses. It's four letters. Um, is Plasma, are you in the audience? No. It's a serial interface though, right? It's a, it's yeah, a standard yeah. serial interface. That I, I believe it has a one clock, the data, and ground. It's like, that's the minimum number of digital configuration. Um, and then, since you have two outputs, and say, say you have two channels that you're putting inputting on one end, and how do you kind of select which channels on the outputs that you're actually trying to push to? Like, you have two radios, basically. One has, say, two sensors input, and then you've got another radio on the other end, right? Um, on those two analog outputs. How do you kind of map those channels to each other? How do you know? Does that make sense? Uh, the, uh, the, all of those slides I went through real fast where you saw a big picture of this and which pins do what. Well, uh, there are certain pins that take analog or digital data, you can mix and match, but the a the analog output is two on the other side. Normally, the same pin number that's a switch position corresponds to the same pin number on the other XP unit that's an LED, but but it's really nonsensical. The, the order is one, two, then it's five, seven, eleven, Four, it, it, and as if that wasn't hard enough, the XB goes into a socket where they displace it by one so that you have to know whether it's the pin number of XB or the Explorer. And that's why I think this slideshow is really essential because nobody's done that. I've been all over the YouTube and the internet looking for advice on this and they usually tell you just what you need to do their experiment. And they went to the trouble of, of, of mapping out just the pins they used, and they use these. And I made you a, a picture here that you 
paste on your wall. Oh, yeah. Okay, I got you. Well, thank you very much for your attention. As you can see, I really enjoyed presenting this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.